When you consider the bone mineral density and the issues that come along with uh, a decreased bone mineral density, osteoporosis, you might wonder why the body loses bone or where that bone goes or how it disappears. Um, osteoporosis has a number of factors that contribute to its onset. Um, one of them is a chemical hormonal signal, but the other major contributor to osteoporosis is a loading history and how your body experiences loads. So we're going to talk now about bone remodeling and how your bo body responds or the bones respond to load on them. So bone density depends on the remodeling rate of bone. Bone is constantly remodeling. All through your life, bone is being resorbed and being deposited. And there's this, um, how much it's being resorbed or created depends on the signal, the bone remodeling signal, signal, which is a function of micro strain, so how much it's being loaded, and the number of repetitions, so how often it's being loaded. There's an optimal bone loading zone for every person, and there's a range around that that's called the equilibrium zone, or homeostasis. It's the place where um, the a bone volume and mass is stable. If you move to the right on the signal, you induce bone growth, and the bone will grow at uh, approximately a linear rate. If you stop loading, either reduce the magnitude of the strain or the number of repetitions, you'll move to the left. Whoop, to the left. You'll move to the left, and bone will be resorbed, so it will disappear. And that's dependent on the microstrain and the number of loading cycles the bone body experiences each day. So this is a curve of uh, homeostasis, showing you microstrain and number of loading cycles over the day. And you can see um, that there's a relationship there. And if you get, if you stay there, you'll maintain a healthy bone. If you go above that, you're in the anabolic region where you're building bone, and the bone will get thicker, it will grow, it's shown there. If you move below that loading curve, off that curve, you'll move into a region of bone resorption. So the bone will disappear. When you put in something like an artificial hip and you change how the load femur is loaded by putting in the artificial hip, it doesn't perfectly recreate the head of the femur, then you'll actually end up with bone remodeling and you'll end up with more bone in places where the bone is suddenly loaded and you'll lose bone in areas where the bone wasn't loaded or used to be loaded by the natural geometry and isn't anymore. So you this comes up all over the place when you start to do implants. You can also see it here in this uh, tennis player. So these are bilateral x-rays of a 23-year-old professional tennis player who started playing at age nine. And I'll ask you, is the player right-handed or left-handed? If you said right-handed, you're right. You can see that the bones on the right x-rays are much thicker, are noticeably thicker, larger than the bones on the left side. And that bears the question, mechanically, of what types of loading would this tennis player's arm experience that would lead to this, and how do these geometric differences affect the maximum stress? So why might the body do this? So let's consider the stress experienced by the bone. We're going to think back to mechanics and materials now. We're going to assume a hollow circular cross-section for the bone. So we'll assume that the non-plane humerus, the left side, uh, has both a smaller outer diameter and a larger inner diameter than the plane humerus. And then if you think about a torque being applied to the arm, okay, really probably to the right arm, but torque being applied to the arm, and remember back to mechanics and materials, the shear stress due to an applied torque depends on the torque and the length and depends inversely on the modulus of rigidity, G, and J, the polar moment of inertia, where J is dependent on the radius to the fourth. And so a larger outer radius and a smaller inner radius result, both result in a bigger J. And a bigger J, because it's on the bottom, because the shear stress is inversely dependent, results in a smaller shear stress. A bigger J results in a sh smaller shear stress. Similarly, if you apply a bending moment about the end of the arm, as you might get a bending moment component from a, hitting a tennis ball. Remember from mechanics and materials, stress... Normal stress is MC over I, and I is the polar moment of inertia, which 
again, depends on the radius to the fourth. It's very similar to the polar moment of inertia. And a larger R, O, results in a larger I. And because stress is inversely proportional to I, you'll, a larger I value results in a smaller stress. So in both of these situations, the thickening of the bone, the making it bigger on the outside, results in a lower stress, which is why the body remodels that way. It remodels in response to load, according to Wolf's Law. So that's one side, where you're stimulating something and getting a lot of bone growth and remodeling because you're constantly, you know, you're regularly in that anabolic region, that region where you're building the bone. So let's think on the flip side for a minute. What about astronauts in space, where there's no body weight? Astronauts actually lose an average of more than 1% of their bone mass per month that they spend in space, which, as you can imagine, maybe wasn't a big deal in the 1960s and 70s when Apollo was going to the moon for eight days, but is now a big deal when astronauts spend sometimes as much as a year or more on the International Space Station and will become even more of a problem when we start to send people to Mars. Astronauts typically in space try to do countermeasure exercises, which are intended to uh, induce sufficient strain and strain rates to promote homeostasis. So their goal is bone maintenance, obviously not bone growth here. But it's a big challenge. That's something that they pay a lot of attention to. So I'll leave you with this interesting question. Is bone maintenance always dependent on loading history? Black bears are inactive for up to six months due to hibernating. But interestingly, their bone mineral content and strength don't decrease or with disuse or aging. So this paper by Donahue et al. in the Journal of Experimental Biology in 2006 considered that and measured serum concentrations of hormones and growth factors in bone metabolism to try and figure out why it is that seasonal changes don't affect bears' bone metabolism. They concluded that seasonal changes in the concentration of circulating molecules help regulate bone formation activity. So there's something interesting there, because it apparently isn't just, at least in black bears, isn't just about loading and strain rate. Apparently there's ways that bears regulate those things. So I'll leave you with that interesting question. And the observation that it's really important for your bones right now that you're loading them. And actually, in terms of the osteoporosis piece that we were talking about, it's a big deal and important that you're loading your bones now to prevent osteoporosis later.